Even before COVID, consumer demand has been shifting toward a need for more convenience and greater affordability. On today's show, we'll introduce you to an innovative new clear aligner delivery company that partners with local dentists and orthodontists instead of competing with them who utilize the latest technology and remote treatment to provide convenient quality care. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Ortho Thrive. I'm your host, Richie Gerzon. Today, we have Kevin Dillard joining us. Kevin serves as CEO and co-founder of Clear Blue Smiles. Kevin is a legal expert and thought leader in the orthodontic industry for the past two decades with nearly 18 years of experience as an executive at the American Association of Orthodontists. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Richie. Happy to be here. Glad to be on. So just tell us a little bit about your story. How'd you get to where you are now? Well, um, I come from a non-dental family, um, you know, which is kind of rare sometimes in this industry. A lot of times the uh, ancillary um, salespeople usually have some family that's in dentistry. I didn't. Um, I grew up in a little town in, in Southern Illinois. I'm, I live in St. Louis, was born there, but at a young age, I had kind of a more complicated orthodontic case. And my parents kind of understood the value of having an expert orthodontist care for me. Yeah. And they took the investment of driving four hours, uh, two hours, one way up to uh, Gus Sauteropolis. Wow. So they really uh, understood the value of it. Two hours each way. Wow. Two hours each way every month, um, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And and Dr. Sauteropolis also treated my dad in the 1950s. And in in the Midwest, Dr. Sauteropolis is, um, uh, sort of to the late Dr. Sauteropoulos, I should say, he passed away several years ago. Yeah. He is to orthodontics in the Midwest, sort of what uh, Stan Musial is to the St. Louis Cardinals. Oh, wow. He, he in, embodies like the, the tradition, the expertise, and also he's just a good ambassador for the industry. He, um, I think he was uh, on faculty at, at SLU Ortho for something like 50 years, did a lot of cleft, cleft palate work. And um, uh, he told me this story when I was in, in treatment, and I don't know that it's true, but I want to believe it, um, that, that I was one of the cases that the AAO actually sent to the Smithsonian uh, Institute back in the late 80s, early 90s as a, as a uh, display of what modern orthodontics can do to different types of, of bite problems. Wow. Okay. Uh, later, when, <laughs> when I went to the AAO, I could never verify that because they yeah, lost right. all the records of what was sent, but I, I want to believe it's true, so I'll believe it's true. So. Um, but, you know, going on from there, 10 years later, uh, after making a very strong impression on me, what orthodontics can do in a very personal way for a person and their self-confidence, their smile and health. When it, when a position came open at the AO, I, 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 I wanted to work there, of course, because I understood what that means. I, I could believe in, in the message of orthodontics. Yeah. So tell me about your career in AO. What would you do there? What was, uh, how are you doing? I started purely in, uh, I was in the legal department the entire time, started in government advocacy and spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., which is actually in, in that role, which is where I met one of the uh, co-founders of our company, Dr. Bill Crutchfield. Mm-hmm. I, I like to joke, I think, um, I think Dr. Crutchfield and I have had more dinners together with the rest of the Council on Governmental Affairs and, and, and the Political Action Committee of the AO than um, almost anybody else, uh, you know, <laughs> that must've been I think, fun. I think, I think, I think we have visited the dining rooms of every good steakhouse and seafood house in Washington, DC. And we met with all, you know, politicians, um, you know, from, from, uh, senators to congressmen to, to people that, um, yeah, it, it was a good, it was a good experience there. I moved on. I became associate general counsel in, uh, I want to say 2006 it was more of a purely, uh, legal role. I was still overseeing the advocacy. And then shortly thereafter, I became the general counsel. Okay. And which of course is the, 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 the chief lawyer. Yeah. And in that role, I was overseeing um, all of the legal affairs, the association, all of the government advocacy uh, role. And then the last year that I was there last year and a half, I served as uh, both general counsel and co-executive director because the previous executive director had left uh, sort of suddenly. So in that time there, it was an interesting time. I learned a lot, uh, but I had that experience of going in from a mid-level association worker to 
co-executive director and general counsel at the end. So I got a very broad spectrum of experience across the association. Yeah, it sounds like um, it. Yeah. That so I see you got you got a legal risk management course that you designed. What, what, tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, we did a, a legal risk management course in a, in a podcast, too. And it was sort of our effort in the legal department to provide value to members. And that was all happening at a time when, um, you know, there's a lot of competition. The association was facing a lot of uh, struggles to retain members. Yeah. And show value. I mean, and that's a tough, that's a tough position for any association, especially now. I mean, I think associations are facing a lot of pressure. Um, but the uh, podcast was meant as a way that we could just jump into the podcast studio and very quickly and effectively communicate news and information to members. Yeah, uh, it often great. focused on risk management because mm -hmm. um, we knew what most of the calls coming in were about the legal calls. Uh, same thing with the, pod, with the uh, legal risk management course. We uh, designed a four hour course to go into residency programs. And the course was designed to answer the 16 questions that almost every orthodontist will face in their first year of private practice. Okay. Everything from, everything from, uh, you know, what to look for in contracts to what happens if a patient stops paying for treatment or they stop showing up, and just about everything in between. It was a, honestly, it was it was the my favorite aspect of the entire uh, my entire employment there. It was just it was a fun time to get out to talk to residents. Um, see what's on their mind, um, get to know the next generation of orthodontists and, and show them in, in, in the way that I could that the AO had something to offer them of, of value moving forward. It was no charge. And I got to tell you, I think my favorite program, um, and I think we, we presented this, I presented this in about a couple of dozen across the country from California to, to UNC Chapel Hill to um, MUSC. Yeah. In, in downtown Charleston. And that was a, a great program. So what was the trend? How did you transition from that to where you are now? Well, um, in the last several years that I, I worked at the AO, I was also a spokesperson to the media about um, clear liner care, direct consumer companies popping up, which, which that pretty much dominated the last five years of my work there. For obvious reasons, a lot of the traditional mm -hmm. orthodontists did not like what was happening in what I'd call a direct consumer category. And it was actually kind of funny. I, it, my very first annual session at the AO, 2001, yeah. I remember a line had just begun. Uh, Invisalign was almost a brand new product at the time. And there were a lot of members at that annual session who were really upset at the fact that Invisalign had sponsored the, the conference lanyards, the, oh, wow. the things that you yeah. hang your credentials on. And they got together and I think about 15 or 20 of them <laughs> had, had a ritual burning of the lanyards because they just could not stand Invisalign. No. And they said at the time, um, you know, this is just going to commoditize orthodontics. It's going to turn into, you just walk into a, a big box store and uh, get a scan by somebody who's not a dentist, and then you're going to get your aligners a couple of weeks later. Turns out they were kind of right. It just took about 15, 16 years to happen. Um, so, you know, we designed, um, we, a lot of members were calling the AO saying, what can you do to shut some of these companies down? That are, that are oh, that's this. straight. How they, that's how they went about it. They just wanted to just shut it down because just saw it a huge that's like risk to their career, I guess. Right out of the gate, um, we we want to shut these companies. Now. Of course, an association is extremely limited in what it can do to yeah. influence the industry. You can't um, shut it. down. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay, you can't shut it down. I mean, there's something called the Sherman Antitrust Act. You know, that Teddy Roosevelt passed uh, 110 years ago that prevents associations from doing um, much other than enforcing a, a standard of ethics yeah. or a code of ethics and um, advocating for its members. And any association, AO included, could go to a relevant government body and advocate that it enforce its own rules or change its rules. That's not monopolistic behavior. That's that's good advocacy. That's what any... any um, any citizen has a right to do under the First Amendment, and that yeah. includes associations. So, and this is public knowledge, uh, five, five, four or five years ago, 
we started writing to state dental boards saying, here are your regulations. Here are what some of these companies are doing. We think that it's not uh, in accordance with your regulations and statutes, and we want you to do something about it. Uh, and that's up to you, uh, what, what you do about it. To my knowledge, I don't think any state dental board really uh, did much. And I think- Oh, what a shame, really. So you made them aware well, of it and they still didn't take action. It made them aware of it. Uh, I, I'll say this, I think a lot of them were kind of scared by the the 2015 Supreme Court case that dealt with teeth whitening in North Carolina. And I won't get into the weeds of that case, but basically the Supreme Court of the United States uh, didn't allow the North Carolina Dental Board to enforce a regulation that they had about who could perform teeth whitening. And that kind of sent the entire dental board world into a little bit of chaos because I think in, even today, we don't really know if most of the dental boards are composed in such a way that they could promulgate and enforce regulations in a way that won't be challenged by a company. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, with that as background, here's what I learned at the AO. In talking to the new residents coming out, in talking to the media about these direct-to-consumer companies, two things became very, very clear. One, teleorthodontics is not going away. Uh, um, there's absolutely. a demand for it. Yeah. There's a demand for it in the media. I'm uh, sorry, in, in, for consumers. Yeah. Um, and, and people want it. And, and we're going to have the industry as a whole, professionals are going to have to adapt their practices. Because, you know, in my view, this is the bridge from, you know, that first annual session with Invisalign. Uh, I think if an orthodontist is not associated with some kind of teleorthodontic brand or company, probably within a couple of years, and I think COVID sped that timeline up, if they're not associated with a teleorthodontic brand, I think they're going to be seen like an orthodontist today would be seen if they don't offer clear liners at all, sort of behind the times. Ah, oh, that's an interesting uh, prediction. I, I could see that possibly happening. I mean, just look at, uh, Rich and I were just talking about pickup at the grocery store, you know, um, Harris Teeter's chain down here and they've had it for a while, but you'd never see anyone in the line. And, you know, right. it, was, it was almost like the idea was ahead of its time. And now all of a sudden it's packed because mm -hmm. you know, yeah. behavior has changed and it's probably not going to change back very quickly, even when this... Uh, pandemic issue is over. Exactly right. And, and when I was um, talking to the media about some of the direct -to consumer companies, I would say orthodontics is not a commodity. It's not a product. It's a complex biological process. So when we created Clear Blue Smiles, my partners and I, we, we saw what was happening in the market and we were concerned. Because uh, none of us believe that it's safe and effective to treat patients based upon nothing more than diagnostics that they have taken themselves or from a 3D digital scan that somebody else takes of them. There's a yeah. lot else that is, is going on that needs to be done. And we knew that somebody, the professionals need to step in here and say there is a way to take some patients. Uh, and we believe it's, it's a pretty big percentage of patients who could benefit from the therapy we help to manage through orthodontists. But there is a certain percentage of patients that can benefit from clear liner therapy in a completely remote scenario, as long as they get a full complete panel of diagnostics taken by a dental professional at the beginning, and then have a very robust ongoing monitoring by orthodontists and dental professionals to make sure that things are happening like they need to happen. And, and give the consumer that ability to have convenience and expertise and high quality care without, you know, without having to get into a car and drive to an orthodontist for two hours uh, or a half an hour every, every six weeks. All right. So there so, comes in clear blue smile. So kind of just tell us if those who don't know, mm -hmm. what is it? How is it different than these direct to consumers or just traditional orthodontic yeah. experience? Yeah. Well, thanks for the question. I mean, we get lumped into direct to consumer a lot. I think people take a look at us and they say, you're just another direct to consumer company. And, and we're not at all. That's the first distinction. We, uh, we like to call ourselves direct to provider. We, while, while, you know, we hope the public and consumers hear about us and we'll certainly be advertising to them. We're not asking them to do anything uh, to diagnose themselves 
that, that's going to be used in actual treatment. They do go through a 2D uh, initial di uh, disqualification process. Yeah. And we're very proud of our disqualification process. Before a consumer ever gets treated through our process, it, it goes b before three or four different dental professionals and at least two orthodontists. And we encourage our orthodontists to disqualify the patients if they're not a good case. So we send the patients, if they are qualified through that 2D scan, to a dental office that's in our network. Those dental offices take a complete panel of diagnostics, including a perio probe, a general caries risk, um, a panoramic x-ray, because we want to know what's going on underneath that gum line mm -hmm. to make sure it even is healthy to begin with. Uh, we get, of course, 3D images, clinical photos, and then our and a, a perio probe, if I didn't mention that, for our orthodontist then to examine uh, before we then treat that patient through an orthodontist. So the patient gets the best of both worlds. They get a virtual setting where um, they are encouraged as, and in fact required in our system to be uh, checking with the orthodontist through dental monitoring devices. And um, they can be sure that when, if they are treated by us, that they have gone through a complete panel of diagnostics and we're not just treating uh, all comers based upon what patients provide to us and in, in, in that alone. Yeah, so you're really getting the data you need to make a responsible decision for these patients. <clears throat> We started, we started, so, so Bill Crutchfield and I, and then later uh, Dr. Cadrol when he came on board, we kind of went through a thought exercise. We said, we know this is happening in the industry. This is going to continue to happen. And it's either going to be what we, what I would call a rush to the bottom in terms of standard of care and a cash grab, or there's going to be a company like ours that come in that says this, this can be done and it can be done correctly, but it can't be done correctly based upon nothing more than alginate molds taken by a patient or a 3D scan yeah. and then sending the, the aligners to, to the patients and saying, you know, you're on your own. So we kind of went through this exercise of saying, what would take, what would it take for the most traditional minded orthodontist um, to say, if they examined our system to say, you know, that, that works, I get it. I would feel comfortable treating a patient like that. They may not. That's be a good way system. to go from the perception of the most traditional. Okay. Let's see. And, and, and between Bill and me, we know a bunch of them yeah. and, um, and, and have the highest respect for them in, in the, the academics and, and the people who have been around and have their names on journals in every place. And we thought, what would it take to convince them that we have a good system and, and we are confident and, and proud of the fact that we have that system. So if a doctor, why, why would a doctor want to be an affiliate with Clear Blue Smiles versus just offering this themselves or just offering Invisalign? What is the well, setting yeah. there? Um, we make it easy. And I can almost guarantee uh, if, if there's a doctor out there that is using Invisalign and wants a teleorthodontic option in their practice, that the package we can offer them, it's going to be, uh, they're, they're going to make a better profit and I think they're going to have uh, far more ease of access into this industry by partnering with us than doing it themselves. Not least of which we get, you know, we can offer a great price. We, we take the, um, we take all of the headache away. We, we handle the payments. We pay the lab fees. We compensate the doctors up front. They're not out any, uh, any upfront money by, by working with us. So we can pass on those savings. And we can also free up chair time because- Oh, so they're not, they're not out any upfront lab fees like traditional uh, work, while working with his line? That's been interesting. None at all, none at all. We, we are an option for them. If they sign up, uh, whether it's an orthodontist or a general dentist, it's two different roles there, of course. A general dentist, we're compensating for the diagnostics that they're taking. Yeah. We're, co we're compensating for the, for the time and service of the diagnostics. Um, and for their administrative effort of up, uploading these these records, for the orthodontist who wants to offer this, they can um, offer it as another option. It doesn't cost them anything to be in our network. Uh, they don't pay any lab fees. They don't have to sit up. Uh, they don't have to pay the upfront dental monitoring costs. We don't require them to prescribe only our treatment, so they're free to do the in-person Invisalign cases. So if if a traditional orthodontist is looking for a teleorthodontic option, 
they can come to us and we can say, if you have a patient who would fit into this, that you could safely treat remotely through the technology that we're working with, put them, put them through our system. We'll save them some money. We can pay you up front for it and you're not out any money. So it's just another option for them to have. And, and by the way, that orthodontist then shares a, a, frees up chair time and they don't have to then reschedule that. Yeah, and that's not a small every. thing, especially if, you know, I have, not. I have some clients that they like having one office. They have no plan on expanding their one office. So it's just a matter of increasing mm -hmm. profitability as much as possible. And by the way, mm -hmm. I only want to work four days a week and we're not changing that. So you bet. There's a, it's nice to have levers to pull because you can achieve a really profitable single office and work four days a week. So, I mm -hmm. mean, that's a good option there. So why, so why wouldn't someone just 3D print their own aligners? Is it just because you're taking so much of the logistics out of it and it's just easier for them to just press that easy button and you take care of it? Is that the main reason? We take all the headaches away. I mean, there's a cost associated with 3D printing your own, your own aligners and there's a logistical uh, cost to it. I mean, you have, to, you have to have the people there to do it and you have to maintain the printers and you have to buy the, the material to do it. Uh, and I know from my time at the AO, the two most common questions we would get from orthodontists is what do I do if a patient stops paying me? Because most orthodontists, vast majority, finance their own patients. And what do I do if they stop coming in for visits? Two yeah. very difficult problems and there's and there's no easy answer to either one of them. Absolutely. Um, the other complaints were I'm paying too much for my lab fees. Um, to keep up with technology, I have to have all of these different passcodes and I have to have all these different accounts. So that is part of what informed our uh, strategy in building a company that takes every single one of those headaches off of the orthodontist and it frees up their time to be doing what they are trained and love to do, which is straighten teeth and oversee the clinical aspects of the orthodontics. So like I said, you know, in our system, we handle the payments, we handle the lab fees, we handle all of the everything else, it's turnkey. It's, it's easy for the orthodontist. Do you have a kind of a figure, like a stat of an average amount saved with Invisalign versus Clear Boost Smiles uh, in that case? Well, um, so, you know, let's take, let's take an average case. Uh, and yeah. I know this from personal experience, just having my kids uh, going through orthodontics and, and hearing what other people are saying as they price compare. So if you take an average 12 month clear liner case, a brick and mortar orthodontist who's going to see that patient recurring in their practice. It, you know, where I am in St. Louis, it's, it's uh, probably going to be in the neighborhood of $6,000 for a 12 month Invisalign case or, or a yeah. clear liner case. That sounds Kinda about use right Invisalign for that case. area. Yeah. I, I use Invisalign sort of generically in this, in this sense, but um, you get my meaning, but, but for that, that orthodontist is, they might be asking for a down payment from the patient. Maybe not. They are going to be paying between, I'm going to take a guess, between $1,200 to $2,000 for the lab fees for whatever, whatever aligner company they're working with. Um, then they have to go out and, and buy the other ancillary stuff. If they're going to do remote monitoring, they have to pay for that service. And then they have to wait probably until month eight, nine, or 10 for that patient to pay, assuming that that patient is paying to get into a profitable standpoint on that patient. If they stop paying or if they stop showing up, then there's another problem associated with that. Of course. Um, not to mention the fact that if they're bringing them in, bringing them back in every six weeks, they're taking up chair time that could be used for capturing new, new patients. So we can afford then to turn around and compensate those doctors up front for their time in the diagnostics and overseeing of the patient and, and, and take care of the lab fees and everything else. Um, Will they make the same profit over the course of a 12 or 18 month case, which by the way, 18 months is about the, the, the extent of which we would treat. Yeah. Uh, it depends. They may, or they may not. It may be a far better deal for them to, to partner with us because again, that, that uh, lost opportunity time of the chair time. And like you said, there's a quality of life issue with our, with our system. They could take one day a week or one day a month and make a lot of money managing patients through clear blue smiles and not have to be tied to an office. They could do it from anywhere. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. So what's, what is the general cost for a treatment for clear blue smiles? 
depends. We have three different tiers. Uh, it's starting in, in it, of course, it's customized. We're not, um, you know, it's not a one size fit all. It, if, yeah. if there's a six month treatment, it's going to be in the neighborhood of about twenty five hundred dollars, a few a few uh, dollars less than twenty five hundred. For a, a twelve month, it's going to be in the neighborhood of four thousand. In an eighteen month, it's going to be about forty five hundred. And of course, there's there are different prices between there if it's a single arch versus dual arch treatment. Yeah. Most cases, of course, are dual arch, so it's going to be about twenty five hundred, four thousand, forty five hundred for that six twelve, eighteen month. So a, a pretty significant savings on general over a, a brick and mortar orthodontist. So I assume you see Cleaver Smiles as a differentiator for a practice. Can you just talk a little bit about how you explain that to a doctor that's in, uh, thinking about it? For sure. Well, um, I, I love talking to the, to the traditional doctors. And, and you know, uh, if, if consumers or other doctors go into our website, they can see the doctors that, that we're associating with. These are traditional brick and mortar orthodontists who, who in many cases have been around a long time. Um, so we're having success with that model, like I mentioned earlier, saying this is, this is how you do this the right way. Yeah. So the differentiator is what we're seeing in the market too, which I think there are a lot of consumers who have been bombarded with tens of millions of dollars worth of advertising that says you can do clear liners at home uh, with no office visits. Um, that, that, that message meets a lot of people. I think there's a big market of people out there who see that messaging. They understand that it can be done remotely and at a lesser cost because you don't have a lot of the overhead of an office, but view it, um, view it as lesser quality and they're not going to choose that for them or their children because they want a doctor involved. Absolutely. And they want that, that, that higher touch, higher quality experience. So we are meeting in the middle there. And we're saying with technology we're bringing, bringing together, you can offer this to your patients um, who might otherwise really like that price break and the convenience of not having to go to the office, but also give them the assurance that this is expert driven, it's expert care, they know who the orthodontist is, and they know that they're getting that really high, high, high touch, high quality kind of care that they would, you know, that probably wasn't possible even 10 years ago. So I know this just because we just interviewed dental monitoring. Philippe was amazing. But to me, that's really integral to making yeah. this whole thing work at a high level. Can you just talk a yeah. little bit about how dental monitoring kind of works synergistically with uh, what you're offering? Yeah, for sure. Um, two things. Two things are absolutely needed to, to do virtual treatment like this effectively and safely as possible. That is that complete diagnostic uh, evaluations that we we're talking about earlier taken by a professional and to the ongoing monitoring. Um, the AI technology, the, the ease of use of dental monitoring. And, and by the way, we're, we're tying in our practice management system, which to my knowledge, I don't know any other company out there in this direct to provider space offers uh, for those patients through Greyfinch uh, based in Little Rock. Uh, we, we've worked with uh, Jake, uh, Julik at, at Gray Finch and Philippe with dental monitoring to kind of have a package that makes this as easy and intuitive as possible for all the doctors and all the patients involved. In our system, Richie, we, we absolutely require by contract that the patients check in a certain percentage of time per quarter. Uh, we, we want them to check in about twice a month, separated by at least 10 days, so that the doctors can see that uh, they're wearing their aligners. And if they're not, the doctor can go in and make a note that the patient can see that maybe they need to wear a, a set of aligners for an extra week yeah. um, to, to, get the best, to get the best outcome. We think that's necessary. And if those patients, and we don't mean to be, be harsh about it, but we are taking the, the brick and mortar model and adapting it to a virtual model. And like I said, when I was general counsel of the AO, if you have a patient who stops showing up for more than about two or three appointments in a row, you start um, you start the termination process. You give them a chance to catch up, uh, but if they don't catch up, then you terminate them because that doctor doesn't want to be responsible for a patient with their braces or aligners on that they don't see for a year, yeah, or don't have any chance to monitor for a year. So we do the same thing. We we adapted that model into this, and we say if a patient stops showing up for those virtual office visits so many times over uh, a three or four month period, we're gonna start that termination process. Wow. 
All right. We just talked to Jake from Great Finch. So I'm also familiar with that. That's very helpful. Yeah. Tell me how that works. How is that really helping out the uh, service you're offering? Because he has a really, I thought, innovative and forward-looking patient mm -hmm. management system from uh, what I heard from him. And, and we are benefiting greatly from it. Um, they're great to work with. We, we just, our, our doctors, uh, my, my partners, doctors Gaudrill and, and Crutchfield, believe that to, to do this well, um, there needs to be a practice management system that is easily accessed by the dentists in our network, by the orthodontists in our network, and the patients in our network to be able to go in and see if there are notes uh, that from, from their treating orthodontist that they need to do something, you know, that, yeah. and that's, that's the place for the orthodontist to say, Hey, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, maybe you need to spend more time flossing between uh, a certain portion of your teeth, uh, or, or you have a little gum problem that you need to go see a general dentist about. Um, that I think we're the first and only in the nation to provide that kind of care in a virtual system. Yeah, so every all the data is talking to each other and it's easily accessible to the patient and the doctor. I mean, that is right. the way it should be. To me, it mm -hmm. seems obvious, but I'm not in all these practices. I just hear the uh, complaints about things not working. I know a lot of my marketing right. software doesn't play very nice, so <laughs> I'm looking for any improvements there. Um, does dental insurance or health insurance uh, work with the service? Yeah, so, so every patient will know who their, who their treating orthodontist is. Um, you know, if you're in Virginia, it's going to be Dr. Crutchfield right now. And in, in Massachusetts, it's going to be Dr. Gadrol. In California, Dr. Allen. In Hawaii, Dr. Shake. And so on and so forth, Dr. Whitlock in, in Arkansas. Um, they are your doctor of record. So, you know, just like any other uh, company that, that is a management system, which is technically what we are, we're, we're an administrative management system for those doctors to treat those patients. Um, we don't process the insurance, but the, 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 the patients can take the claims and mail it or, or, or electronically transmit it to their orthodontist and, and those orthodontists can, can process the insurance just like they would if they were in the office. Oh, great. So what kind of financing or payment, payment terms do you guys offer or plans? Um, we, we can finance everything from, from $1 up to the entire maximum dollar amount. We, we go through a third party financing company. They have very attractive offers qualified. We can, we can do a two month, I'm sorry, a two year 0% offer. Um, we expect that's gonna be popular with a lot of folks. Um, but I think uh, you know, the maximum, maximum APR is still very low uh, with, the, with the programs that we have set up with that system. And it's very intuitive for the customer. They just go, they, they apply for credit and it, it's, it's, it's uh, very easy. Oh, that's nice. I mean, financing is such a huge part mm -hmm. of that conversion process. A lot of our campaigns usually, at least every yep. few quarters, we're going to talk about financing because it's usually a big obstacle. Yes, it so is. So I saw on your website that you're involved with the Ocean Blue Project. Can you just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? So um, this is one of our favorite things. A lot of people, when when we kind of talk about this, are like, you know, what does what does orthodontics have to do with removing plastic from the environment? And it's sort of the, the basis of the entire brand. Uh, we wanted to make a, a blue chip orthodontic management service that does teleorthodontics the right way. Um, but we also wanted to do something, do our part to, to give back. And we know clear aligners are fantastic at moving teeth. They're absolutely terrible for the environment. Mm. And it's not, a, it's not a conservative or liberal issue or red or blue issue. Uh, I think we can all agree as humans that when you see a, a whale wash up on a beach dead because they ingested uh, 500 pounds of plastic mm -hmm. or see a sea turtle strangled by a plastic six, uh, you know, a, a six can holder, a six pack holder, it's a travesty and it can be averted if we all do our part. We know we can't solve the problem alone, but we're trying to set a, a model for the rest of dentistry, quite frankly, to do what we can to reduce single use plastics uh, to help clean up the, the the beaches, rivers, and streams, which is where Ocean Blue comes in. Ocean Blue does a fantastic job at organizing beach cleanups. Uh, they have some, I think, proprietary robots that can suck up styrofoam and, and plastic from the beaches. Oh, that's cool. Uh, it is very cool. Uh, being in the Midwest, of course, uh, here in Missouri, we're not close to the to the ocean, but we uh, we we also know that. Um, 
if plastic, if a plastic water bottle hits a runoff stream in Missouri, there's about an 80 to 90% chance it's going to make it to the Gulf of Mexico. So what it's we're amazing, going to be doing really, is, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, you know, something, something gets into a runoff stream. It, it hits the Missouri river, which hits the Mississippi, which, you know, is going to flow right into the Gulf of Mexico. Even if it doesn't, it's plastic in the environment. That's not yeah, good. It's going to get consumed and it takes a thousand years to break down. So, um, we, we contribute to the ocean blue. Uh, we contribute money to them. We're also co-sponsoring these beach river and stream cleanups. We're going to be working with, uh, middle high school environmental clubs to go and, and, and expand their reach. We're also working with ocean blue on a, um, almost a, a, uh, like a Nespresso style recycling bag for liners. Uh, we know that aligners really can't be recycled right now, but the next best thing you can do is to encourage patients to keep them, put them in a container, mail them back so they can be safely disposed or upcycled. Nice. And okay. we, we could have some cool products uh, in the near future um, by upcycling these, these aligners. So, and, that, and that's not really, I mean, that's not where our environmental um, uh, interest ends either. We're working, Dr. Alyssa Shake, who's a orthodontist uh, servicing Hawaii right now, is passionate about this. She has, she's authored a, um, a guidelines that we're going to be publishing pretty soon. It's aspirational. It's also very achievable, achievable, and it's for dental and orthodontic offices, broken down into three categories. What you can do this quarter, actually what you can do today, uh, what you can do in the next quarter, and what you can do over the next year in your practice to be more environmentally friendly and sustainable. And we're gonna be circulating that to the AAO, we're gonna be circulating it to the ADA, uh, to some of our, our tech partners um, to, to get their approval and hopefully try to get this into as many dental offices as we can to say, these are things you can do that while small, if everybody does, it makes a huge impact and it probably will even save you money. So, and, and <laughs> I don't mean to, uh, um, you know, uh, talk too much about this particular aspect, but we like to give our customers gifts. They get a brand box when they become a patient of, of that we're helping to service with yeah. a reusable stainless steel mug. Uh, we encourage them. We, we include great. bamboo toothbrushes. Uh, we work with cocoa floss, uh, trying to get those uh, better products into the hands of consumers. Wow, social responsibility is super important. It's great that you're really making a difference. So as we're talking about the future, what do you think the future holds for Clear Blue Smiles? I think we're hitting that middle process. And if you look at the entire industry of orthodontics, I think it's it's bifurcated. I saw it at the AEO. Um, it's, it's going in two different ways. It's going into the high touch, high quality, uh, which is the traditional brick and mortar um, model. And then there's the low touch, uh, low cost model of some of the direct consumer companies. I think we're meeting in the middle and we're taking the best of both worlds. We're taking um, those patients who, who want the high touch of an orthodontist we're, and we're matching them up with an orthodontist who knows that these certain patients can, can um, benefit and would like the convenience of at-home treatment with a lesser cost. And we're matching those people up. Um, we're having success, we're expanding rapidly um, I think uh, right now we're in eight states as we speak, but I think by the end of the second quarter, we're going to be in upwards of, of 20 to 25 states. We're hearing all good things from our providers saying, once they understand what we're doing, they say, this is, this is fantastic. And why wouldn't I do it? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, that makes a huge difference because I'm sure you get people asking a lot of questions about that. So if mm -hmm. someone is interested in potentially joining a network. Is there like an ideal practice that is the best fit? Or do you, what are you looking for in a practice to be part of the network? Um, you know, this, this model can fit into just about any orthodontic practice or any dental practice, quite frankly, um, in that role was taking the diagnostics. Um, I, I think our model is set up such that any orthodontic practice, if you're in an urban setting, there's gonna be a lot of people who don't wanna fight traffic to get to you. If you're in a rural setting, uh, you know, you can service more patients throughout your state that they don't have to drive that far. Um, so we're not, you know, we, we, we talk to anybody and everybody. I think our model, again, has something that, that uh, could benefit any practice. Awesome. 
Oh, well, someone wants to learn more, where should they go? What's the best place to see? Go to our website, clearbluesmiles.com. Uh, there's forums to fill up there. We have live chat agents that they can um, leave their information with or just simply email me, uh, Kevin at clearbluesmiles.com. Happy to, happy to answer questions from uh, patients and professionals. Awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we uh, wrap it up? No, I, I appreciate it, Richie. I mean, I think this is a, it's a fascinating time in, in dentistry and orthodontics. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of angst from a lot of people. And I think it's going to be a fascinating next five years to see how this industry, this industry trend, you know, kind of transforms. And I think we're, we are in a transformative time. And like I said, I think, I think the, the, the key point is, orthodontists need to be associated with some teleorthodontic brand uh, to remain relevant over the next five or six years, I believe. And I, I don't think they're going to find a brand that is more committed to aiding a traditional practice and keeping the standard of care um, as high as possible than, than, than we're doing. I think they would like it, especially if they're worried about the future of orthodontics. They're going to love what we're doing. I know. Being on the side of the practice and keeping the standard of care super high, I think, is... Mm where it will, it will get practices interested in what you're doing. Well, Kevin, right. thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. It's been fun talking with you. All right, you. thank you. Yeah, right. you too. Thank you, Richie. You're welcome. According to Kevin, teledentistry is the future. If that's true, then you somehow need to meet that demand. Clearbo Smiles could provide that hybrid model that gives everyone the convenience they want from direct to consumer brands, but keeps that quality of care super high because you're dealing directly with an orthodontist throughout the way. If you have an idea for an episode or you want to be a guest on the show, visit orthothrive.com. If you want to talk to me directly, just email me at richard at orthosalesengine.com. Keep grinding, keep thriving, and I'll see you next time.